Hello, you sentient ball of stardust. My name is Casey Davis. I'm a therapist, and I'm an author of the book, How to Keep House While Drowning, where I talk about ways to make it a little bit easier to take care of yourself when you're overwhelmed, stressed, have mental health issues, physical health issues, or maybe you're just in a hard season of life. Maybe you're looking for a place that you can come and listen to some practical advice. This is a podcast for all of the self-help rejects. We're going to talk about skills for survival and self-kindness. And I'm going to leave the pop psychology at the door. I promise not to tell you to meditate or to journal. We're just going to give you some really insightful conversations with hopefully some practical advice. So I don't believe you need to pick yourself up by the bootstraps. I don't want you to just try harder. And I don't believe that laziness exists. So join me over on Struggle Care, where we can find compassionate solutions that help us function a little bit better. New on Curiosity Stream, how do you connect a 16th century potato to limitless energy production? Could Napoleon's toothpick have a direct link to a machine that predicts the future? And how can a 1700s conch shell chart a course to humans connecting their brains to the internet? James Burke's visionary series, Connections Returns, for a new generation. Experience all new Connections with monthly, annual, and bundled plans. Find the one that works for you at CuriosityStream.com. Hey there, thinkers. It's me, your girl, your host, Elena Grace. And I'm here to bring you another episode of I've Been Thinking. So thank you very, very much for being here to listen to it. I'm so, so excited to give you this episode. And, you know, if this is your first episode here, thank you for being here. Welcome. And if this is your 125th episode, thank you for being here. I love you. You are the reason. (laughs) So... This episode is a little bit different uh, than some of our recent episodes. We've been focusing a lot lately on identity and really a lot about identity lately. From episode 117, uh, I talked with my friend Catherine about identity and leukemia. Uh, Episode 119, I talked about modern masculinity and curation of art to inform on an idea with Josh Porter. And episodes 122 and 124, we talked about gender identity and sexuality. So there's been a lot of focus on identity lately here at I've Been Thinking. And while I love that, I love that so much. And I think it's such an interesting and important thing to explore. And I'm sure we'll get back to it in no time. This episode is quite different. This episode kind of harkens back a little bit to episode 117, Identity and Leukemia, with Catherine. This episode is about the legacy of a sweet little girl taken far too soon by a disease, a rare blood cancer that she didn't deserve, that no one deserves, and about what her community is doing to keep her name alive and in our hearts and to better the lives of other children experiencing some of the same terrible circumstances. So this episode centers around the life and legacy of sweet little Finley Kate and is brought to us by today's guest, her mama, Jessie. And Jessie and I talk a lot about some some fun stuff and some hard stuff. We talk about the book that Jesse wrote um, to try to make the families of other children in these kinds of situations to, to try to help their lives be a little bit easier. We talk about Jesse's specific experiences with Finley Kate in the hospital and with 
Finley Kate's siblings who were left at home. Um, and we talk about a lot. We talk about a lot, a lot of what goes into figuring out life when in a lot of ways it seems like it should be put on hold. So this episode is great. It, it's an incredible step into a resource for families who might be experiencing a child with cancer or with a chronic illness who can't leave the hospital. Um, this also is an awesome opportunity for the average person who hopefully will never have to have this experience for that person to gain some insight into what those people's lives are like. Those families that we see on the St. Jude commercials or that we hear about in prayer requests at church, this is your opportunity to gain a little bit of insight into that and to hopefully realize that it is far more nuanced than any of us ever really believed, than any of us ever realized. So Jessie is an incredible, incredible person to talk to. She's a wonderful woman. She's a wonder woman, honestly. Jessie, I adore you. And I think that you are... A superhero and so and I think that all of my listeners might just agree after this episode I hope you do so with all that being said I hope that this episode does something for you there the links to Finley Kate's rally fund fundraiser with a ph um is in the show notes for today's episode and if you go to the blog post for today's episode you will find the links to everything that we talk about in here so go check it out and i hope that you guys really enjoy because i've really enjoyed creating this for you guys here's jesse so I just wanted to say thank you so much, Elena, for having me on your podcast. This is very exciting. I my name is Jesse Huskin, and I um, I'm I'm a social worker. I'm an infant toddler developmental specialist, um, and I am also the parent of um, of a child with cancer. Jesse, thank you for being here today and for sharing this with me, for trusting me with this. Um, with your story and your family story and your vulnerability and all of it, I cannot say enough how thankful I am that you agreed to to come on with me for this. Oh, thank you. Of course, friend. I have fallen in love with you and your family and your story, and I... I'm really, really proud to be able to bring this today because as you and I were talking about a little bit before the actual episode started, um, this is a topic that not a lot of people think about, not a lot of people want to think about, and right. people who are experiencing it tend to feel very alone. So I'm I'm honored that you'll let me do this with you to bring light to this topic that deserves it. It it deserves so much attention because it's, it's something that happens to people. Yes. So tell us about your family and what led you, because we're going to be talking about your family, your experiences. We're going to be talking about Sweet Finley. And we're going to be talking about the book that you wrote called Surviving to Thriving, Living Your Best Life with a Hospitalized Child. So tell us about what led you to the point of writing this book. 
So Finley, we have three children, and Finley's the youngest. Um, she, it was a week before her fourth birthday, and this was back in um, 2021. She, in October, she was um, experiencing some symptoms. We had been taking her to, we took her to urgent care a couple times. We took her to um, an orthopedist. We took her to her pediatrician. And we never really got a good diagnosis. They just kind of felt like it was probably a virus. Um, well, anyway, her symptoms continued, you know, she, she continued just deteriorating and we finally took her back to her pediatrician who discovered um, a new heart murmur and she sent us immediately to the ER and she told us, she said, um, you know, I, I'm sorry, but I want you to know in advance, this is going to be a very long night for you. And we went to the ER and that was the first time they did blood work. And when they did blood work, so the average person, to my understanding, has maybe four to 6,000 white blood cells the average healthy person, um, when you have leukemia, a blood cancer, your white blood cells will uh, will start, you know, multiplying and getting out of control. By the time they did her blood work, her count, her white blood cell count was over one hundred thousand. Oh wow! Yes. So um, that's when we found out that she had leukemia. A week after that, we went immediately to the PICU over in Pensacola. Um, Sacred Heart, and within a week, it actually was on her birthday. We celebrated her birthday that morning, and that afternoon she was intubated and being flown by emergency jet to Shans. Um, so, wow, yeah. So we, I have experience working in a hospital setting as a social worker, not as you know a medical person. So I had some knowledge of medical things. I had some knowledge of how hospitals work, but certainly not, you know, to the extent that we were, you know, thrust into in this experience. Um, so when, when we arrived at Shands, we were given this wonderful, you know, like, um, basket of just resources and supply blankets and, you know, just a whole bunch of different little toiletries and things like that. And one of the things that was in there was a book. And the, the woman giving it to us said, you know, I would strongly suggest that you read this book. There's so much good information in here. This was written by a mom who, whose daughter went through leukemia. And I really, there's so much good stuff in here that will really be helpful for you. Um, and people kept telling us this is going to be a marathon. It's not a sprint. And I looked at that book. I picked it up and it was over 400 pages long. Oh, wow. And it was, um, this family's story, just their story from beginning to end. And I'll be honest with you. I never opened it. You are getting so much new information you are trying to piece together your work life how you're going to take care of your other kids you are trying to understand and learn you know a whole new medical language that you've never been exposed to before and the thought of reading this book i'm sure there was great information in there but to go through that much material to find things that might be helpful to me was just the idea of it was overwhelming and it wasn't going to happen. Right. And we spent a lot of time re researching, trying to find a resource, just a very compact, easy to read um, resource for just give me the highlights, right? Like, give me, give me, tell me what I need to know as I enter into this. And there is nothing like that on the market, nothing that we could find. And, you know, we went through a year of living more than 80% of our time in the hospital with Finley. And we learned a lot of things on our own. And, um, you know, we talked to other families. We learned from the staff there. We learned from the social workers. We learned, we just, we learned a lot of different things from a lot of different places. And what was frustrating to me was that it seems like every person who gets a diagnosis like this has to reinvent the wheel because no one has sat down and put together all that knowledge into one resource that you can just hand out. And so when Finley's battle ended, 
um, this past this past October, um, just hours before her fifth birthday, you know, a, a couple months after that, I sat down and I said, this has to get done. This has to get written. So I teamed up with Craig Brockman, who is, he's an indie author, and he's also a retired family nurse practitioner. So he has a lot of that medical experience. And we wrote this book as a handbook short it's 60 about 60 pages long just as a summary of all that information that i wish someone had put into my hands that first week right i mean you did a wonderful job you you gifted me a copy to to look through um before this episode and including the foreword it's 63 pages it, yes. including the foreword and the resources it's 63 yes. pages and I mean, I read through the entire thing in two sittings, uh, just kind of just not even like focusing, studying on it. You know, it, it's not something that's hard to read. It is very easy to go through. Well, it's hard to read because it's difficult to put yourself in that position, but you've written it very well is, is my Thank point. You. And you... You talk about things that I think are obviously essentials to parents or loved ones or just people being put in this kind of situation. But honestly, I think a lot of this could transfer to just general life in a lot of ways. Um, yes. And... I, I've seen you parent your two boys, and I think you're so sweet with them. And I think a lot of that shines through in the book, just how sweet you are, how what a good mother you are, and how much you prioritize your child's happiness. And there were so many times when I thought to myself, these are the kinds of things that a lot of parents need to hear, not just, the, like I said, not just the parent of a child in a hospital, the parent of a child mm -hmm. battling a terrible disease, but the parent or guardian of any child should should be reminded to give their child choices when possible or to say yes when possible it, because that's just mm -hmm. those are things kids deserve yes i yes. think i think you did a beautiful job of it <laughs> thank you thank of you course. a lot of it a lot of it came from you know a, a lot of these techniques in here were things that i learned as um as I received my my certification in education as um, as an ITDS, an infant toddler developmental specialist, and so you know my experience and my kids are all young too, right? So I don't have that experience yet, that personal experience of working with older children or teenagers. Um, but I spoke with a lot. Of, so this book, there there's a lot of anecdotal stories in there about Finley, but. This is not meant to be a book about Finley. This is not her story. This was meant to just be um, a compilation of what we learned through our experiences with her, yes, but also from other families that had their own unique challenges that we maybe didn't experience ourselves, but they did and other families do. So, um, you know, there, there's, there's anecdotal stories in there about teenagers and their families and how they um, dealt with things. So, you know, a lot of it came from my work experience, but a lot of it came from observation and seeing what other people do right and what seems to work and be helpful. Child life is an incredible resource, absolutely incredible. And they are, to my knowledge, they are present um, in, in just about every, if not every, pediatric hospital in, in the United States. And they have just a world of knowledge and experience of how to help kids through this, you know, from birth to, you know, to 20. <laughs> so they are there too. So 
yeah, like I said, a lot of this is geared more towards the younger kids, but there is good stuff in there that is absolutely applicable to older kids as well. And it also points you to, you know, hospital resources that would be available to you to, to work with if, if you're running into a situation or a challenge that's not addressed here. Right. And I thought that, first of all, I thought that it was beautiful that, like you said, it's not Finley's story. Um, in spite of the many Finley anecdotes. But the point is that those are what give you the experience to write this. So it, it entirely makes sense that it's full of those, but you do include anecdotes of other families that you met and experienced. And I think that that is really important, just like your chapter six, make it relational. You're creating these relationships with the reader based on everything that you've experienced and you're inviting them into your life through these Finley anecdotes and you're you're being vulnerable with them with those uh through those but I also I do think that so many of the of the suggestions and the lessons you learned, even though, like you said, they're geared through your experiences with a younger child, I think that they still can apply to older children in a lot of ways, especially the ideas, I think, of giving them control where they can have Mm -hmm. it and being transparent and letting them know what words mean, letting them learn about things not hiding any of this from them, telling a teenager, like lying to a teenager about what a procedure is about, that would be so hard, I would imagine, on that teenager because they come out of that and they, like like the experience you shared with Finley being lied to about being put under and she was going to a princess party and she woke Mm -hmm. up and there wasn't one. To be a teenager and to say, hey, we're doing this to you, and you wake up and you're missing an organ or something, because that's what it was all about in the, obviously this made up, made up anecdote, but that would be awful. That would be terrible. Mm-hmm. So I think that those, those do transfer in a lot of ways. And honestly, I can see a lot of these transferring to adults as well. You know, you want to protect your elderly mother or your your dad from knowing exactly what's wrong with them because maybe he won't handle it well, but they deserve to know. Yes. And but. we do have... Oh, I'm, no, you're fine. We... We do have um, two more books in the works. Um, There's going to be some time. We we really want to give this current book a chance to get out there. And and another thing, and I don't know if I ever shared this with you, um, but we are... um, you know, raising raising funds in Finley's memory through Rally Foundation um, to fully. F- our goal is to fully fund one childhood cancer research grant, which right. um, you can fully fund a grant with fifty thousand um, dollars. And Rally, the reason why I chose to do this with Rally is they are just they they get an A plus rating for transparency. They're 93 cents of every dollar that they receive goes into research wow. um, and not the overhead costs, which is, you know, phenomenal for a nonprofit organization. So, um, you know, the funds that we raise for them, she has her own page on, on Rally's website, rallyfoundation.org, um, Finley's Fund, Fund with a PH, <laughs> just like Finley with a PH. Um, but I don't touch that money. Any if you shop our business partners or if you donate directly, that that all goes straight to to rally. It does not funnel through me at all. But one thing that I'm doing with this book is that the sale, every sale of of this book puts money into that Finley fund. So we are. I'm hoping that this will be a blessing. Um, 
you know, many times over to families going through this, as well as trying to fund some of that much needed, um, you know, childhood cancer research. Because right now, I don't know if you know this, Elena, but um, right now, only 4% of available research money in the United States goes to childhood cancer research. The rest goes to adult. And pediatrics is you know, p kids medically are not just miniature adults. They are, they are different. And so even if we have a child who has leukemia and we made progress in figuring out treatments and, and things for adult leukemia, that does not mean that we figured anything out um, that's beneficial for childhood leukemia. So, um, you know, there is a real need there. But so, so we are letting this get out there and, um, you know, hoping that people find out about it and um, spread this around. And then we are, are the next book that, that we're going to be working on, um, it's, actually, it's actually mostly written. We have a little bit of tweaking and stuff to do. But the next one is going to be geared towards friends and family of someone going through um, hospitalization with a child. So, you know, I, I get a lot of requests from people, oh, my neighbor, my neighbor's um, son was just diagnosed with a brain tumor. What do I do? Um, you know, what do they need? They're not answering my texts or phone calls. Um, you know, family members reaching out. How can I support them? What can I do? I don't even live in the area. Um, so, you know, people want to help, but they feel helpless. And I think you can get a lot of ideas from this book, but the next one is really going to be geared specifically toward that community that wants to come and surround the family going through something like this with some real concrete, practical ideas of things they can do to help. And then once we launch that, after, after that, the third one that we plan to launch is going to be one geared towards adults um, and how to navigate hospitalization as an adult. Um, so I think that, you know, all of these things are going to be very important, but I really wanted to start with giving support and resources to the families going through it. And, and that's why we launched this one first. I think that this is a beautiful legacy that Finley has left with us. She has given such an opportunity for you to, for you and your partners to really, to educate and to spread awareness and to help people who desperately need help. And I love hearing that your next book in the works is for friends and family, because one of my suggestions, honestly, reference this book was going to be that people purchase it, whether they're experiencing this or not, because it is so enlightening about what parents and families with a child living in the hospital experience, but it could also be very helpful for their friends and families to see it through this perspective. So the fact that you're thinking about those people now and how they can help and how they like just thinking about it even through that perspective I think is really important and just so incredibly helpful in the broadest sense because you're not just saying how can this family look for help where can they look for help how do you ask for help you're saying okay now this is how you give help does that make sense Yes. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes yes. I ramble. <laughs> no, I I think you you hit the nail on the head because you know people. What I hear from so many people, the, you feel helpless. You feel so helpless, and you know a lot of people's first thought is um, go fund me or something like that, right? And that is that is so important. It is so important. We. Um, we have what I would consider to be excellent insurance, very good insurance, but her medical bills were, they, they ran in the millions and 
they we have wonderful coverage but even the best insurance policy is going to deny some things so you the family is going to find themselves in a situation most likely where they need to they need to meet a deductible and then whatever their insurance denies they are responsible for 100 percent for that cost so and then, of course, you know, you have things like missed time from work. You have travel expenses, depending on, you know, where you're at um, and where your child is. You have, um, you know, in the hospital, you have the additional costs of food. You can't do your own cooking. Um, you, there, there are a lot of costs that, that you just don't think about initially. They, you know, they don't necessarily come to mind right away. Um, so those funds are so important. They are so vital. We needed those desperately for her and we are so grateful for everyone that came together with that. But there are practical things too. And, um, you know, so, so I think that, um, people just having ideas of what they can do practically to help people. So, you know, one of the things I'm going to touch on in the next book that was a big blessing for us, and, and this might not be right for every family, but one of the big things for us, and what I heard from family after family after family in the hospital as well, was, you know, what was the best thing for me was when people didn't ask permission. They just did it. So, you know, I... I we had some, we came home um, one time during a hospital break. We'd been in the hospital for about five weeks and we came home and someone had mowed our grass. I don't know who mowed our grass. Someone had pressure washed our house. I don't know who did that to this day. I don't know who did that. No one asked us permission. They just showed up. Someone planted flowers in front of our house and kept them watered for us so that we had a beautiful, you know, um, some beautiful flowers to come home to when we got home. And, and so instead of walking back home after being gone for five weeks to all this work that needed to be done on top of everything else that we had going on, you know, people in our community just came by and just did it. And they didn't ask us permission. And honestly, if anyone had asked me, you know, what can I do for you? I would not have thought of those things. I would not have said, can, do you mind planting some flowers for us? <laughs> so that we, do you mind mowing my grass? But they were so helpful when, when we got home. And I'm so grateful to all the people who did that. And, um, we had, we had someone in our neighborhood, um, just take control of picking up all of our packages that that showed a better door um, and hanging on to them for us and then bringing them to a you know things that you might not necessarily think about um, we had a family member who so you know when you are a family in the hospital people want updates your family and friends want up your larger community wants updates everyone wants to know how you're doing because they care but when you're in it trying to keep everyone updated is it's overwhelming. It is absolutely overwhelming. So if you reach out to a family going through this and you don't hear back, just know that it's not because they are upset that you reached out. They're not annoyed with you. They are just overwhelmed. They're inundated. They've probably been getting hundreds of messages of support, but they, they need those messages of support. So don't stop sending them. Just recognize that you may not hear back and be okay with that. Um, what our family ended up doing was um, my sister-in-law is a nurse. And so what we ended up doing was just getting her on speakerphone every time there was a doctor in the room and she would listen and she would write an update for every, she, she was in charge of giving updates to everyone. So we didn't have to worry with that. So there was one point of contact and she, we had given her permission to share, you know, publicly on Facebook for, for people who wanted to know. Not every family is going to be okay with that. Um, but that was a big help for us. And that's not something that I would have necessarily thought about before going through it ourselves. Those are a lot of great ideas and, and points of where the needs are for families experiencing this. And I think that it says so much um, 
first of all, that your community did just step up and do so, so many thoughtful little things like taking your packages to make sure they were safe or mowing your grass or planting the flowers. Like those are thoughtful little things that people can do. And I, I 100% think that the idea of don't ask, just do it. That's what you need when you're going through that. You don't want to have to say to somebody who says, let me mow your lawn. You don't want to have to say yes, because that feels like an imposition. Even through every, to me it does. Even if I were like on the other side of the world in a hospital and somebody said, let me mow your lawn for you, I'd say, oh, you don't have to do that. That's okay. I'll take care of it when I get home. So the fact that somebody just stepped up and did it, that's so incredibly helpful. And I don't think that's something I would have thought of. So I'm glad that that happened for you. And I'm glad you're sharing these experiences because that's such... It's an incredible idea and opportunity for hopefully other people to step up in the same way for people they know who are experiencing similar things, right? But yes, also, I think that the knowledge of how the of the financial burden that it can be in so many different ways so in the book you talk about how expensive hospital meals are and how expensive fast food meals get and how expensive it gets to make sure that you had the tiny little toys for finley to share with people because that brought her joy like the finances rack up and it's not just the medical bill bills it's everything around it and I think that's something else that people don't necessarily think of first thing so the knowledge that there are play and, and the resources you list of places that you can go and listing you know get an insurance case manager reach out to these kinds of organizations like Angel Fly or Lasagna Love. Uh, you know, those are awesome resources. And sharing that with people who need that kind of help, that that's absolutely priceless. Yes, and we, you know, I my background is social work. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't know about all of these resources. You know, we've all heard of Make-A-Wish, right? We've all heard of, there's certain things we've, you know, many of us have heard of and are familiar with, but when you're in it, yeah, you know, I mean, I worked in the, in that field and I found out about resources that I was unaware existed. I hope you don't mind if I switch gears a little bit to a different type of resource that was, that was also just so helpful for us. So you one thing we learned so we did not have to deal with a teenager or, or or older child who had their own phone and was internet savvy that is not a challenge we faced we were able because of finley's age we were able to be in 100 percent control of what information she got and our policy with her was you know no no secrets that's what we said to each other all the time so we we wanted to be transparent with her all the time um and that built i think a lot of trust and it f- built um a feeling of safety and security for her which you know was was just very important um in how she adapted to her new her new life um but for teenagers you know i was speaking with a mom who she said, you know, I know my I know my child is is researching her diagnosis. I know she's I know she's googling it. And I have no idea what she's reading. I don't know if she's reading good information or bad information. I don't know. You know, I can't even address some of the things that she's reading because I don't know what they are. And you know, so much on Google <laughs> or you know, those things are not um accurate. And so what I did at the, at the very end of the book, there's a whole list of, um, you know, medical websites and, and things like that. And what I did was I reached out to two pediatric oncologists 
and they actually put together this resource list for me. So these would be good. They would be solid, um, trustworthy um, platforms to use to do your own research. I know a lot, you know, a lot of people like to do their own research um, about diagnoses, but then also these are resources that you can offer your older child who, who might be wanting to do their own research as, you know, trustworthy sources that you can feel comfortable giving them. Um, child life in whatever hospital you find yourself in, they may have additional ideas as well. Some of these are that I listed are geared more towards kids. Some are not. They're, they're you know, for an older audience. Um, but child life would be someone else that I would definitely ask for, re, you know, age appropriate resources that maybe your older child can, can do their own reading on if they want to. And I would imagine those would be very helpful for older siblings of a younger child experiencing this or or something like that. And you even have one in here, at least one that's listed as a guide for siblings. So somebody whose baby sibling is experiencing this, they can have these trusted resources to learn more as much as they want to about what their sibling is experiencing as well. Yes, and that's huge. I think that a lot of times, you know, I, I referred to my boys as the forgotten ones um, a lot, and I think sometimes they, f- they felt that way, you know. Really? Um, yeah, their lives got their lives got completely upended and Finley started becoming what everyone was talking about. That's who everyone was focused on. Everything we did revolved around Finley. Well, we can't do that because of Finley. Well, we have to do this because of Finley. And it's very normal for kids, for siblings to feel um, jealous they saw Finley getting a lot of presence. They saw Finley getting a lot of attention. They didn't see the the ugly parts of it that she dealt with. They didn't see as much of that. They they saw all the positives. They felt like you know, it, I was living in the hospital with Finley um, all the time, so I rarely got to see them. They I you know my, I heard my kids mention once or twice, "Well, you love Finley more than us," oh. and. You know, all of that is normal. It's very, very normal. And there are, child life is a great, they sat down with our boys and spoke with them about, um, you know, educating them in an age appropriate way about what Finley has and what she's going through and, you know, processed things with them. Um, So they can be a great resource for siblings. But you're right, you know, giving these medical resources for siblings to read, I think could be could be huge and also trying to keep in mind um you know as a community and as as a family of of what things can we do to help the siblings realize that they're still important right so um we had our community came together and my boys both had birthdays they have birthdays three weeks apart and they both had birthdays right after Finley relapsed in July. And so we were in chaos in, in our personal lives trying to, to take care of all of that. And now my boys have their birthdays. And now we can't have a party because we have an immunocompromised child. And we can't, um, you know, all the things that we were going to do just went out the window. And our community came together and just sent them cards and letters of love. They, someone um, got happy birthday signs and put it in um, their grandparents' front yard because that's where they were staying. Um, people showed up and dropped off balloons and gifts on the front doorstep. They sent them in the mail. They, you know, so they really came together and gave my boys a one wonderful birthdays at a time when it's very likely they would have had horrible birthdays otherwise. So, um, you know, remembering siblings is so important and it's so easy to kind of overlook, but, but they need attention too. And they need, 
to be able to feel like they're a part of things and that it's not all about the hospitalized sibling because that can get that can get very hard on them right and especially you mentioned in the book and I think I've always felt this um but the way you phrased it I thought was really really nice kids can hold more than you think they can and even those siblings who are not hospitalized, who are left at home, they're, like you said, they're seeing just parts of what's going on. And they're not getting the full picture because maybe you don't think that they can handle it or you don't know how to do it in an age-appropriate way or, or whatever it is. And so they're only getting this very skewed part of the story and I can only imagine the kind of hurt and trauma and and resentment that they could build in them when that is all they're getting when they don't have the full context so the resources that you're providing and the perspective that this book and the forthcoming books are going to give, I think are going to be very, very helpful to families in remembering the importance of, of informing and including the siblings and making sure that they're not the forgotten ones. Yes. And you know, one thing we did and we, we did a lot of things wrong. We did so many things wrong, and we learned so many things by trial and error. You know, we were, I was not as, as you know, um, present for the boys at the beginning as I should have been. I was so tunnel vision, you know, on, on Finley, and I think that happens to a lot of people. But, um, you know, you learn, and you observe, and you evolve, and one thing we ended so finley's fight ended um her her last three months were in memphis um at saint jude and um while we were up there so the boys were up there with their grandparents in an rv at a campground for those three months while um, i was in the hospital with finley and my husband was traveling back and forth from florida um so that he could continue working and what I ended up doing is, and and it ended up working really well, and I was thinking at the end, I wish I had figured this out earlier, but what we ended up doing is when Finley was in the hospital, we would take the boys, and usually a parent, so it would be like when my husband came up and he would be with Finley in the hospital and I'd be with the boys, and I tried specifically and intentionally to find things for the boys that we would not be able to do with Finley. So normally I would have to say no, but we also had to be careful though to make sure that these were um, socially distanced uh, activities, that these were not activities that were going to compromise, um, you know, her her health, um, that that would expose us to things that I might bring back to her in the hospital room that um, would be devastating for her. So we had to get creative, but some of the things that we ended up doing, um, we climbed a mountain. We drove about three hours away. There was a mountain in Little Rock, Arkansas, and we drove there and climbed that together. That's so awesome. They loved it. They loved it. And then we found um, a place that did horseback riding lessons, and so they got to do horseback riding. So we we tried intentionally to find little things that could just be there and that we could say yes to um, that were special for them, and that really seemed to help a lot. I know that your boys are going to look back when they're older and when they're adults and they're going to realize how much you put effort into being there for all three of them. I, I think you, I think you're an awesome mom. I'm tearing up a little bit because I think you're incredible, (laughs) Jesse. (laughs) Well, thank you. We've, we've learned a lot and we have learned, you know, you can't, it's hard to get anywhere if you're not willing to learn from things other people have, have done right. So we tried to, to take what we saw other people doing that seemed to work 
and we tried to figure out a way to um, to use that in our situation. And like I said, we did a lot of things wrong. We did a lot of things wrong, but you, you figure it out and you learn and you just try to get better. And that's why, and so many of those things we didn't have to do wrong. If we had had someone put a book in our hands like this, that first week, we would not have had to learn those things the hard way. We would not have had to do trial and error. We would not have had to, um, you know, figure out <laughs> when we walk into a hospital, okay, what's what's the food situation? What can I bring? What do I need? And then figure out that you are, you know, dreadfully un- unprepared and have all the wrong stuff. And, um, and then fig- try to figure out a way little things like we now we were blessed enough that our first hospital stay someone in our first few days thought to tell us about the laundry facilities that's not everyone's experience and we ran into a family that went for six weeks they they were they were from our local area and they were at a hospital in texas and they went for six weeks going out and using, finding laundromats in the local area to, to wash their clothes. Can you imagine trying to coordinate that? No. I mean, trying to figure out someone sitting with your child while you, while you do clothes. And when you have a child on chemo, you go through, you go through clothes, you go through sheets, you go through blankets, you go through a lot of stuff and trying to keep up with that and then trying to find a laundromat and then getting there and then hanging around while your laundry is done and then getting back to the hospital. Six weeks they lived like that before someone mentioned, oh, well, there's there's a washer and dryer right here on the floor. And they had no idea. <laughs> so, you know, little things like that, we can save people from having to learn the hard way Um you know, every time they get a new diagnosis, every time someone gets admitted to the hospital long term who has never experienced that before, because there are certain things that are going to be true for most pediatric hospitals in the United States. Um, so there, there's going to be differences, of course, but there are certain things that are going to be true regardless of where you go for the most part. And what we try to do is is combine all that information and give it to you so you don't have to trial and error and go through six weeks of finding laundromats in the area when the whole time there was a washer and dryer 50 feet away from your room. Um, so that's what we're trying to do here. Um, cause I don't feel like there's, I, I, I feel like it's completely unnecessary for people to have to go through that when so many have gone through it before us and we can combine that information and present it to the people who come behind I think that, I mean, that's just a perfect, in my opinion, representation of your family and the fact that you're so willing to admit you did things wrong. The fact that you want to now let people learn from the things you did wrong and the things other people have done right. And again, you're turning this into part of Finley's legacy. It's really beautiful. And it's so full of hope and, and just everything good that can possibly come of something like this. You are making this, I guess, kind of a silver lining from my perspective. Not that there is truly anything good, but this is this is you turning your pain into ways other people can hopefully hurt less from my perspective. And I think that's really beautiful. And I think that's really representational of the light-filled and joyful and artistic and pink and funny and beautiful little girl that I've seen so many videos and photos of now. And I'm honored that you're willing to share part of her story with, with me and with us and with everybody. Thank you so much. I mean, she was, you know, she, she was a light. She, didn't cry. She didn't complain. She 
just dealt with it. When she got sick and needed to vomit, her concern was that there was a mess now that someone needed to clean up. It wasn't how she was feeling. And that's how she lived her life. You know, the the title of the book, Living Your Best Life with a Hospitalized Child. Um, I'm not sure, Elena, if you know the background story on that. Yes. She, yes, you do. Okay. <laughs> um, so just for the listeners who, who may not be familiar, but a few days before she passed, she wasn't able to, um, she couldn't swallow. Um, speaking was very difficult for her. The leukemia was, was spreading everywhere and it was swelling everything. So um, she, you know, you, could, you knew she was very uncomfortable, but she never complained. She never cried. And a few days before she passed, we were we were in the hospital room, and she was laying on her bed, and she asked me for some some Pepsi. She wants some Pepsi, so I put a little bit in a straw, and just dripped it into her mouth, and she got as big of a smile as she could on her face. Her face was very swollen, and so she wasn't able to 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 do a, a typical smile for her but as big as she could smile and she leaned back on her hospital pillow and she closed her eyes and she said I am living my best life and that is how she lived every day it didn't matter what her circumstances were it didn't matter what she was going through she wanted to live her best life and she chose that she chose to live her best life and to keep that attitude and focus and perspective, regardless of, of what was happening to her externally. And it was very inspiring to see it was, you know, it's heartbreaking as a parent to see your child going through that and imagining what they are feeling at that moment, because I can't, I can't imagine it. But to see her being so strong and so positive and it just made me feel like if she can do that, if she can do that at four years old, I can do it at 40. So, you know, is, is living in a hospital awful? Yes, it is. Is it, is it fun? No, it's not. Is, but she chose to make it fun. And so much of what is in there, I learned from her. She came up with it. She was she led by example and she did so much right. And I wanted to pass that along. It is possible to live your best life. You can be in the hospital and your child can live your be- their best life. Um and I feel like that's her that's a big part of her legacy. The joy that she brought to people um, the connection she had with people. She was so people focused and so happy. And I want to bring that to other people and bring that hope and that knowledge to other people that, that it can be possible. As awful as it is to watch your child be going through that, there are things we can do that you can do as a parent that we can do as a community for families going through this and that we can we can still life isn't it feels like it it feels like life should be on hold while you're doing that it's very tempting to say well life will start again once all of this is over but for finley there was no chance of starting again after that that was that was 20 percent of her life and that is that is where her life ended and as sad as that is you never know how it's going to end. 20% of children diagnosed with cancer in the United States will lose their fight to it. And you don't know for sure how your child's story is going to turn out. And I hope that they are in the 80%. But if they're not, let's do everything that we can to help them live their best life through that time because it is possible and she showed me how to do that and I'm trying to give that light to other people going through it. So that story of her saying I'm living my best life that is what really 
did it for me. That is when I fell in love with her and when I realized that I had to I had to start doing what I could for you guys. So I you know, that was when I got um my day job to partner with you guys for our yearly fundraiser event and when I designed those stickers um to raise funds for Finley, which I'm still selling. So um, if anybody wants a Finley-inspired sticker, they're on my website, and I'll put the link to it, and that's all going to Finley's Fund. But that story is the perfect example of just what an inspirational little nugget she was, just a little nugget of gold in this life. And again i love that you're turning her and her story and you're taking all of the inspiration that she gave you and you're spreading it and giving it to others um also reality like you are very realistic and you do have these statistics of you know 20 percent of children diagnosed in the u.s will succumb and i think that's very important but the hope is important too and I think she represents that a lot but that also made me wonder and you don't have to answer this question if you don't want to but did you ever feel jaded by this experience I think that's a very fair question I so angry yeah um I get I get depressed there are there are days where it's very hard to get out of bed um you know it's 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 not easy and it's 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 very tempting to go down the road of it's not fair um, you know, she, she was, it's not, it's not fair. It's, it's not the, the natural cycle of life. Right. And but, you know, I, I just, and to, it, it's very tempting to feel bitter about it. It's very tempting to um, you know, be jealous of other families that I see, um, you know, with little girls. And that's very, it's very hard and it's very real. But, you know, she never looked at it as, she would tell me when she was in the hospital, she would tell me, I miss going swimming. I wish I could go swimming. I wish I could go to the beach. The beach is where I want to be right now. I wish I could be swinging, um, you know, on our swing set. I wish that we could go for a walk. I wish I could go outside. I wish I could be in the sunshine. She wasn't allowed to leave that unit. She'd be there for four or five weeks, and she wasn't allowed to walk out those doors into the hallway. No outside time. Um, You know, no bike riding. No... Nothing that you would normally be able to do as a child. And she knew it. She knew that she was missing out on things. She absolutely knew it. But she chose to make the best of where she was because she had no control over where she was or what was happening. But she did have control over her attitude and and how she approached her circumstances. And that was really inspiring to me and I try to stay in the mindset of you know what happened to Finley there is there is nothing we could have done differently right thing there you know it it it's it's no one's fault everyone did everything they could we we received the best treatment the best care you know really that the world has has to provide and you know I mean when we told our boys 
that she had relapsed the final time and that there were no more treatment options. My, my youngest looked at me and he said, it's really sad, Mom, that the best hospital in the world isn't better. Mm. And I said, yes, it is. You know, it is. You're right, baby. You are right. It, it is very sad. So could I change anything for Finley? No. The only thing I could do was give her as great of an experience as possible during the time that she was here. And now what I can do is try to change life for future Finleys. So, you know, the, the treatment that Finley received is 30 years old. It's um, treatment that kids were receiving in the 90s for the type of leukemia that Finley had. And the reason for that is just the funding isn't there for research. And, you know, the type of, of leukemia that she had, 500 kids are diagnosed with every year in, in just the United States. And the survival rate for that specific type of leukemia is 50%. Um, and if we had more research, um, we could have better treatments. We could have better outcomes. We could, we could be doing better for, for future Finleys. And so we did everything we could for Finley. And now what I can do is try to change the outcome for the future Finleys. And the best way I feel like to do that is to provide information and resources to families and communities of, of how to navigate this. And then what we do is we fund pediatric cancer research. And so I try to stay focused on what I can do instead of what I can't change. And I lost her and it hurts. And I wish that that had not been her story, but we can do things because she went through that. We can, we can hopefully make a difference for other people. I think that is the most beautiful possible outcome for this being her story is to make it better for others. And I think you're doing a great job at it. Thank you. Of course, friend. So I'm not, I often ask um, listeners or sorry, I often ask guests at the end of an episode for resources that they would recommend, but you have the ultimate resource for us right here. (laughs) So I'm going to put a link in the show notes um, and on all the social media and everything to this book, Surviving to Thriving, Living Your Best Life with a Hospitalized Child. And I am going to recommend that even if you don't have a hospitalized child, if you have a friend with one, or if you have known somebody with one, go check this book out because it is such a game changer with how you think about that entire situation, in my opinion. And it's full of all of your incredible thoughts and resources that you have very thoughtfully compiled for people going through this experience. So where can that be found? Like I said, I'm going to put the link in the show notes, but can you tell us where to look for it? Sure. It's, um, it's on Amazon. It's available on Amazon and, um, and So if people are interested in buying bulk, so if, you know, they want to buy it to have available at at pediatric hospitals or anything like that, um, they can reach out directly to me. Um, I'm on Facebook, Jesse Huskin, and we also have a page, um, Living Life Finley Kate Style on Facebook, and you can order them. If you're going to order 10 or more, you can order them directly from me at a discounted rate. And... 
the reason why I'm doing that is I'm able to, if I do it that way, instead of doing bulk orders through Amazon, um, then I'm able to still put the maximum amount possible into the Finley fund from, from those sales, even at the discounted bulk rate. Um, but yeah, in individual sales, you can find it on Amazon. Um, and we do also have a blog um, that we're working on to be a, to be a resource um, for for families who are in the hospital to read. And it's not I I put I contribute periodically to it, but the majority of the um, articles on the blog are from other people. So um, medical people in the field. Um, people with personal experiences going through it. Um, there are some religious pieces on there from from the spiritual community and and you know that part of going through this. Um, so there's that as well, and you can also find that on our Facebook page. Perfect. I'll have links to the Facebook page, to the blog, to the books as well, just so people can easily access all of that, and that will be on the show notes um, and on my personal or on my. I've been thinking blog page as well. So is there anything else, Jesse, that you'd like to leave us with that maybe you didn't get to touch on enough or just like a final thought you would like to, to end on? Um, I think, I think we touched on just about everything. I think that the final thing is, you know, I, People seem to be uncomfortable, I think, talking about child, you know, severe childhood illness, childhood cancer. Um, But it is a growing problem in in this country and around the world. And I think if we make it more comfortable to talk about, um, we can bring more awareness to it. And the more awareness that we have, you know, the 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 more we're going to build up those resources for, for families going through it. And the more also that we'll be able to put resources into finding those cures and finding those treatments so that our survivability, you know, survival rate is not 80%. I think we can do better than that. Um, so, you know, I just, you know, cancer, we don't like that word, but it's okay to talk about and let's talk about it and let's talk about about it in kids because it is real and not talking about it doesn't make it not exist. So, but I, I appreciate Elena. I am so grateful to you for having me on and for, you know, publishing all these links and for giving me an opportunity to, to talk about this experience and to talk about the resources that we're trying to get out there for people. I just, I'm so grateful for that. So thank you so much. It's literally the least I can do to try to help um, the noble cause that you are undertaking and to help help share Finley's legacy because it deserves it. So it's the least I could do. And I'm honored that you came on and trusted me with this today and are willing to share this part of your life with me. So thank you, Jesse. Absolutely. Hey, thinkers. Thanks for listening to today's episode. I can't say enough how proud I am to get to bring this to you guys. And I can't say enough how thankful I am again to you, Jesse. You are a shining star and I I am in awe of you. For everybody listening, make sure that you check out www.ivebeenthinkingpod.com. Go to the blog and select the blog post for today's episode, number 125. And that is where you will find the links to everything that we talked about in today's episode. Or go down to the link in your show notes to the blog post. And that will take you to everything. Finley Kate's Rally Fund, to the book on Amazon, to the Facebook page for Living Life Finley Kate Style. Everything is on there. So go check that post out, okay? 
Now, while you're at it, make sure that you follow Living Life Finley Kate Style on Facebook because there's lots of really great updates on there. Since you're already on social media, go follow I've Been Thinking everywhere you can. So Facebook, I've Been Thinking with Elena Grace, Instagram at I've Been Thinking Pod, and make sure that you bookmark the website I've Been Thinking Pod.com so that way it's easy to find next time you need to look something up on there or you need to listen to your next episode. Also, if you're interested in supporting the podcast monetarily, which we are, of course, so very thankful for, you can do that on patreon.com forward slash I've been thinking pod. There are different options for different levels of support and different extra content that you get there. We also are eternally grateful for shares Share us on your social media. Share us with your friends. Tell a friend about us. Uh, Leave us a review and send us an email or send us an Instagram DM or something and let us know what you think and how you're liking it because that is how we grow. That is how we improve and that is how we gain new listeners and get to bring you guys even more and even better content is when you share us and when we get more listeners. So make sure you do that. Okay, guys, thank you very much for being here, for listening to today's episode. And again, Jesse, thank you. This episode was hosted by Elena Grace Campbell. It was edited and produced by Tyler Miller and is proudly presented by Stove Like Media. Before we go, I'd like to tell you about our ad partner for today's episode, Dev Kenya. Do you have big dreams and a small budget? Me too. Get your website done for under $500 by a Kenyan web developer, half the price, double the quality. Our friends at Dev Kenya are building a platform to connect Kenyan web developers with those who need a website at a competitive price without compromising on quality. Go to devkenya.com, D-E-V-K-E-N-Y-A.com and sign up for their waiting list and use the coupon code devkenyahasbeenthinking, D-E-V-K-E-N-Y-A has been thinking for 15% off your first website. Thanks, y'all. Hello, you sentient ball of stardust. My name is Casey Davis. I'm a therapist, and I'm an author of the book, How to Keep House While Drowning, where I talk about ways to make it a little bit easier to take care of yourself when you're overwhelmed, stressed, have mental health issues, physical health issues, or maybe you're just in a hard season of life. Maybe you're looking for a place that you can come and listen to some practical advice. This is a podcast for all of the self-help rejects. We're going to talk about skills for survival and self-kindness, and I'm going to leave the pop psychology at the door. I promise not to tell you to meditate or to journal. We're just going to give you some really insightful conversations with hopefully some practical advice. So I don't believe you need to pick yourself up by the bootstraps. I don't want you to just try harder, and I don't believe that laziness exists. So join me over on Struggle Care, where we can find compassionate solutions that help us function a little bit better.